So, welcome back to the afternoon session of the symposium. Uh, I think we have some fun speakers ahead. So, I'd like to introduce you to my dear friend Paula, who will take us a little bit off topic for a mind break after lunch, but maybe you'll find out it's, it's all relevant after all and share her ideas of nature's beauty and how the beauty of the earth comes into our culture and is shared with more and more people. Uh, I gave every other speaker a cup of coffee, but Paula doesn't eat it. So, we did not, we, for those who know her, I did not caffeinate her first. Paula. So I'd like to begin with a quote of a genius scientist and a genius artist. He said, study the science of art. Study the art of science. But he said it in reverse. <laughs> His name was Leonardo da Vinci. And the reason I use that quote is what we all do from the mineral dealers, the miners, and the artists that end up fastening, fast, fastening jewelry, uh, fabricating jewelry, is combining nature art science. And it is my belief you cannot have a masterpiece in any of the disciplines without all three. So I'm gonna take you on a little journey in 2017, I was invited to mount a one-woman show in the City of Lights at the Musée de Minervalogie of Mines Paris Tech. This incredibly gorgeous and historic museum is in the former palace of the Duchess of Vendôme, and it's surrounded by the Luxembourg Garden. I could not believe my luck. Not only is it gorgeous with Trump loyal French parquet floors, but it has hundreds and hundreds of years of mineral specimens from all over the world. So Illuminations Earth to Jewel was my working title and the title of the exhibit. And my mission was to pair beautiful mineral specimens where the jewel that I had fabricated incorporated quite a lot of that material to tell the story of the light of the earth from earth to jewel. So my flying fish of Mandalay was paired exquisitely with seven gold specimens from all over the world that Didier and Eloise put together in the showcase, and it showed the different colorations of gold from wherever they're coming out of the earth. They're not always just that shiny yellow. Sometimes they have more green or rose gold coloration. My second slide was another part of the theme for Illuminations Earth to Jewel. For about 30 years, I've been working with my North American gem carvers because they are surely brilliant, they are original and unique, and I wanted to put in time capsule their genius, which were putting us on the map, winning awards in Germany. Americans were winning awards. And the first slide is Empress in Regalia. This is Empress Jingu. She's a revered empress in Japan. She practiced necromancy, and she also conquered the Koreans for the first time. So she's still revered in Japan to this day. Now that was a dimgitic agate, and it's an inanimate object, but the inimitable Glenn Lair, who carved this for me, is sheer genius. Everything he does brings me to my knees. I've not met many that can carve swirls and and polish Mexican fire opal or any kind of opal and not get it too hot or damage it. Many would not attempt the carvings that Glenn does on a daily basis. So he takes this inanimate dendritic agate and through his art and his finesse 
creates diaphanous robes for an empress. And I love agates. I've always loved agates. They're gorgeous. I think every gem and mineral, big or small, on earth is beautiful. Here's another pairing that DDA and Eloise did for me at Illuminations Earth to Jewel. The pendant on the bust is a fire empress. She's hand carved in Brazilian opal by Glenn Lair, paired with Mexican fire opal to tell the gemological story of opal coming from a lot of places on earth and then this incredible specimen. Help the viewer to make the leap that it really begins from deep within our earth. Often I'm asked, Paula, where do you get your inspiration and what is your creative process? Do you always start with the center stone and work your way out? Well, most of the time I do, but not always. But here's a case in point where if you look at the actual species of a Portuguese man of war, if you look far left, there are two valves. And those are the valves that feed the oxygen to this organism in symbiosis in nature. And I asked Glenn, can you carve these? And if you look at the slide to the right, you can see how brilliantly he executed my request. Down below is the story of how it all began. I was in Tucson. I'm always in Tucson for about 35 years and counting. And I was playing in a big tray of Mexican water opal. And I found the piece down below. It is about the size of a silver dollar. And I leapt up with joy. I literally just leapt up in air and looked at Martin. And I said, look, here's my Portuguese man of war. So I don't know if all of you know this, but most artists that I know, we don't, it's really not about us. It's about this gift that we have that energetically comes through us. We are the vessel, we're the vehicle that just is honored and blessed to make it happen, and we have a lot of fun doing so. But quite often my work comes instantaneously just from the look of a gemstone or a crystal. So here we have Maine tourmaline, our great state of Maine, our tourmaline state of our country. And I've always loved tourmaline. I consider it the mineralogical rainbow. Over 300 recorded colors. Its most hardness makes it perfect for jewelry. And all those colors, oh my. The queen of color can never tire of more colors. So I started a project in Maine, and I'm designing some masterworks incorporating the state mineral. And I'm starting with Mount Marie and this beautiful green tourmaline crystal, mined in Paris, Maine, which is a beautiful town. And I, made, I decided I would make a mineralogical snowflake because they do have wonderful ski season there. And I'm trying to tell the story, translate it from flora, fauna, mineral, into uh, flora and fauna into the mineral kingdom and tell the story of the state of Maine's beautiful mineral deposits. So I made a snowflake, and I don't know if you can count the number of green shades in that snowflake, but I, lo I lost count at 15, I think. And so I'm telling the story of gemology through jewelry. And that's a passion of mine, and I've been doing it since I started. Even as a pipsqueak, I was saying to myself, I need to leave gemological clues. And that's how it started. So the tips of each of the snowflake uh, spikes are colorless barrel, also from the state of Maine. Moving on to the Dunton tourmaline mine, I decided to take a wavy thistle, which grows around those mine locations in that beautiful state. And I translated it into purple enamel on 18 karat gold with some hot pink tourmalines from the Dunton area. Their state flower is the trillium flower. 
So this trillium is composed of colorless beryl, garnet, hot pink tourmaline, and mint tourmaline, which comes all from the state of Maine. Again, I like to tell my secret stories. I like to leave my gemological clues. Now, it's getting more exciting. So I'm hanging out in the state of Maine, and Dr. Raquel Perez, who is the new curator of the Harvard Mineralogical Museum, meets me. And she comes to my booth in Tucson. And I had a double booth this year. And she'd never seen except for a few of my pieces. And she was seeing a couple of hundred of them. And I do only one of a kind for all of my career. And she said, oh my god, we've got to do something for you at Harvard. And I said, well, I would be delighted. So a new story is being birthed as we speak. And I put up the Hamlin necklace because when I gave my talk at Harvard uh, in April, she took me down to see this beautiful, iconic jewel. And as you, most of you know, uh, tourmaline was discovered by the Hamlin family in Mount Maica, Maine, in about 1820. And not only that, this piece is all tourmaline, including the white Goshenite. And all these pieces can be moved around so whatever, whenever the wearer would change her outfit, she could just have whichever color she wanted facing her viewer. And it was bequeathed to Harvard in 1934. And that brings me up to 2020. 200 years later, after the discovery of Maine tourmaline in Mount Micah, Harvard has given us an opportunity, my dear friend, Jeff Morrison, who's here today with his beautiful wife, Jan. We are being asked by Harvard to create another historical iconic jewel representing the state of Maine for the 200th anniversary. So stay tuned for that one. It's going to be a labor of love. And again, I get to tell my gemological clues and my gemological stories that I'm known for in my work. Again, my creative process, and I have themes and tributaries for all my museum uh, collections that I do. I'm always invited to museums, and I'm not really sure why, but I always am. And I always want to go, and I usually create the theme for the show. And while I was doing Illuminations Earth to Jewel right on the heels of it, uh, I was invited to work with the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And I'll get to that in a little while, but I started endangered species at that point in time. And what I do is I study nature and in all of its glory. And I was studying endangered species, and I found the sun bittern. That's the name of this, fly, uh, this bird that's from uh, South America. Look at its plumage. And what if it vanishes? At least there'll be a jewel somewhere translated it to the mineral kingdom, reminding people that come after me that it did exist. So my creative process is to study the creatures. You see my drawing translation. You see the different shapes and patterns. As I'm doing those shapes, I'm creating the jewel in my mind. And I already instantaneously know what the mineral translation will be. In this case, it's ruby, black diamond, cognac and white diamond, and beautiful blue sapphire. And voila, our son Bitten is born, and he's here to stay. So I'm moving on to the Smithsonian for a moment, because the museums in my life have been so good to me in so many ways. In the Smithsonian, I can never thank enough for all they do for our nation and our children, and they've been exceedingly supportive of Crevice. So they approached me, I don't know how long ago, maybe seven or eight years ago, and they said, Paula, would you be willing to create an iconic jewel for us? And I said, well, absolutely I would. And they said, well, we'll give you as many Rock Creek sapphires as you need, and you can do whatever you want. 
And I said, well, that sounds cool. And it turned out that uh, most of you probably know Robert Kane of Five Gems International. He was donating all these beautiful stones. So 27.07 carats later, Conchita was born. And I had only one caveat for the Smithsonian. And they said, well, what is that? And I said, could I please name the jewel after my mother? Because she gave me life and belief in self through unconditional love. I'd like to honor her. And they said, of course. So there is a plaque. It states the 27.07 carats. It mentions Bob Kane and myself. And it's named Conchita. And so the front is as beautiful as the back, as in all the old jewelry. And part of my mission, when I was just beginning, was to keep the ancient metal techniques alive. The human element means everything to me when I'm making jewelry. That's why I make only one of a kind. They're always handcrafted. They're always exquisitely enriched with the ancient metal techniques, such as the piercing on the back of the jewel. Now we're coming up to LA. And as I told you, right on the hills of, Eloise had just written me from the Musée de Mineralogy and said, hey, can we extend the show by two months because people are coming in from Hong Kong and everywhere, and it's so successful for us. And I was standing at my booth in Tucson that year, and two amazing people, Alyssa Morgan and Dr. Aaron Celestine, came up to my booth. And Alyssa cocks her hip to one side, puts her hand on her hip, and she said, hey, Paula, you can have a show in LA at our museum anytime you want. And I said, really? She said, well, doesn't that interest you? I said, you bet. She said, oh, good. We thought so. So we'll, we want to make an appointment for tomorrow morning to talk to you about it. So that's how that happened. And when they came, I said, well, you can see I do a lot of themes. I have mine locations from the United States telling the gemological story. I have creatures. I have um, flowers translated into the mineral kingdom. So what theme would you like? Do you have something specific in mind? And they just went like this. And I said, anything I want? Anything you want. So off I went. And there I am, the day before the opening, standing under one of my endangered species. Her name is Baya Nai. She's a female tigress. And she's made of cognac and white diamonds. She has aqua blue eyes with black diamond pupils. Glenn Layer, my buddy that I adore so much because we've worked together. I've worked with so many of the carvers. But Glenn and I just have a special connection. And that's something else that will be coming out of the gate before you know it, that we've been working on for over 10 years. But that's another story for another time. So here I am, getting ready for opening night. Art of the Jewel, the Crevice Collection is born. So I love Montana. Who can't love big sky country? And I've been out there many times. But it wasn't until I was in a booth at Tucson that I discovered how many colors in the alluvial crystal faces. And I, I hit the mother load. And I was like, I, I sat down in this booth and I said, I need a sheet of white paper right away. And I poured out all the crystal faces and I started immediately planning my mosaic bracelet that you see here. It's a bracelet. They're all Rock Creek slices. They have all Rock Creek faceted stones telling the story of the rainbow over Montana. And if all of you already know the story, just bear with me. The gold miners were looking for gold in Montana during the days of Lewis Comfort Tiffany. Their sleuth boxes were being clogged with beautiful but nuisances of blue pebbles. But they thought they were pretty enough to save, and they didn't really know what they were, and they thought they'd find out later. Well, they got a couple of cigar boxes full. They shipped them off to Tiffany. And George Frederick Kuntz wrote him a letter and said, oh my god, you've hit sapphire. I'm on my way. So they were alerted to the fact that there was sapphire in the hills. So they, when they hit Rock Creek and they saw the plethora of those colors, and they knew that they were sapphire, they went, oh my god, we've hit the rainbow over 
Montana. And so I like to bring the mineralogical stories into my jewelry and into my designs. It's history and it's history in the making that inspires me. And this is a photomicrograph by my dear, beloved friend, Richard Hughes, that I've known for 35 years. We used to hang out in Thailand when he and I were very skinny and very young. And I love him to this day. And what Billy and Vinod and Dick are doing for our industry is just fantastic. So look at the spectra of light in, within the rainbow over Montana crystal. Is that gorgeous? So moving on to my translations and telling the story through flora and fauna in a gym location. This is a photograph of, of a bitterroot flower. It happens to be the state flower of Montana. And it also grows for only a short three days in either the first or second week of June in the most unlikely of places. The soil has no water. It's just like dirt. You walk on the dirt, and it powders up and gets into your nose. But they come every year. And they cover the hillsides. And you can imagine the majesty of the mountains and those gorgeous big skies covered in hot pink. Well, I set off to do a bitter root. And though they're only the size of a quarter, I wanted to make mine the size of a bagel. And I told everybody that I knew that I need 700 pink Rock Creek faceted stones to make my bitter root. Can you help me? And they were like, Paula, are you serious? I said, yeah, I've already got the design. I know exactly what I'm doing. And I only need 700. And they're like, oh god. And so for two years, every friend I knew, and most of the industry, and many of you sitting here, I want to thank you. The industry has always taken care of me. They know I need taken care of. And if I need the stones, I need them. So anyway, after two years, I only had 400 pinks. And I was like so exhausted by that fact, I just thought, I, I, I looked at Martin and I said, I'm just never going to be able to make the jewel. I need to lay down. And so I just went and laid down. And then I thought, no, there must be more species. So I got on my computer. And this is a photograph that I took at the mine location. And there are some that are solid pink. There's some that are pink with the white centers, like you're seeing here. And then I hit the ones that have yellow centers. And so I could finish the bitter root. I had to shrink it down a bit. It wasn't a bagel, but it was maybe an English muffin. And <laughs> I was happy enough with that. And I got to make the bitter root. The stamens are tipped in hot pink enamel. It's all 18 karat rose gold to give that rosy pink glow to the bitter root jewel that was born. So moving to another mine location. So I have been dedicating the last seven or eight. We're really from the beginning, but I got really serious a few years ago that I'm going to be uh, documenting mine locations through art and all utilizing all the rough and cut and everything that I can get my hands on. So this is Yogo Gulch. And um, I decided columbine flowers grow all over those hillsides in the summer right there in Montana and a lot of other great states like Colorado. But I had to have a, columbi a columbine that was blue, and it had to be Yogo. So here you see the Yogo blue columbine, and you see the Rock Creek stamens in the center. And if you look at the slide on the left, you can see the lavenders and purples and plums that kind of come with that. But I love that centerpiece. Look at the pattern. Look at the glory. Now, this is why we call Yogo heavenly blue. Look at that crystal. Look at that color. It is a piece of heaven in your hand. And I decided to do a morning glory. And this morning glory is all sapphire, except for the moonstone. It's a blue moonstone from Sri Lanka for the center. But all the stones are sapphire. The blues are all Yogo. The center star pattern for the insects for their landing pad is actually made from Madagascar hot pinks. And the veins are made from Sri Lanka tourmaline and the lavenders. Here's an all Rock Creek Yogo 
Blue Flag Iris. And I want to shout out to my wonderful friend, Bruce Bridges and Campbell, who introduced me to many wonderful moments on his time in, on this planet. And the family continues to serve our community at the highest standard and level possible. Thank you, Bruce, for all those Savorites. Thank you. Um, now again, back to my creative process and how I translate my work from the flora and into the minerals. And in this case, it's an insect. And in Carnegie Museum of Natural History, they gave me a one-woman show. Well, they gave me two. One was Voices of the Earth, and then the second one was called Garden of Light. And it was over 70 pieces, and it was all about the mineral kingdom, the animal kingdom, and the floral kingdom, and how they're all so symbiotic in nature, sustaining nature. And so it was all set up by different themes, because I'm, as Lawrence Stoller, another great carver in my life, he said, Paula, you are our themologist. And I like to create themes. So I had pairings. I had about seven flower jewels. Midnight Seduction was the one that the GIA bought. It lives in New York City in a vitrine where I can never borrow it because it doesn't open. But it was, a, it was called Midnight Seduction. And it was, had a full empress, I mean, abalone mabe pearl, a natural a natural abalone pearl where the organism is his shell. And it's a beautiful piece that incorporates coral and sapphire and opal. But anyway, all these flowers were in one long vitrine in Wirtz Hall. And I said, well, can I go to etymology? And can I get all the actual pollinators for all the flowers that I've done for the exhibit? And they said, yeah, we have about 3 million of them. I think we can probably handle it. And do you know, they did, and it was so glorious. I didn't know if the bugs or my jewels were prettier, because the bugs were so gorgeous. And the bug man came to my opening, head of etymology, and he was a short man with very big glasses. And he came up and he said, I really like what we're doing with my bugs here. And I think we need to have a one-woman show with your flowers and my bugs. And he was the happiest man at the party. All right, on my last um, mine location that I've been working on and uh, that is so dear to my heart. In the late 80s and 90s, my late great George Crevache, many of you knew him and you knew what an unusual character he truly was. And he was brilliant. He was fluent in seven Asian languages, reading, writing, speaking, four or five Western ones, an accomplished composing musician, and he decided he was going to go into gemstones. And it happened in Bagan. He was standing up, looking over the pagodas. He was doing research for the Lankavatara Sutra, a 15th century sutra in Buddhism, and disproving the Japanese art, uh, uh, linguist before him, Suzuki that the poetry couldn't have possibly been written by one man because the poetic meter changed. So that was our George. Anyway, so he's standing there. And a guy has a jola, a Tibetan jola, which is a man's purse, hand-woven. He's got a mala. And George saunters up to him, and he says, well, you're obviously American, and I'm pretty sure you're a Lundsman. What are you doing with a Tibetan jola? And he says, well, I love the Tibetans. And George said, so do I. He said, what are you doing in Burma? And he said, oh, my friend's in the stone business, and he wants me to invest. We're going to go hunt down rubies and things. And George said, hey, man, could I go with you? I'm interested. I've been schlepping Tibetan rugs, vegetable dyes, but they weigh a ton. I have to ship them in by shipload, and I need something portable. So that's how we come to the tourmaline mine location of the Stuart mine. And he got, he, he became, he went quickly to the top of any discipline he took on. And um, so he, during the, his time on that stint, he uh, also, we went into a cave and he was reading the rock and he put an X on the wall. And he was telling the miners, if you go in there, we're gonna hit a pocket like you've never seen. And he said, and you've got all this water here. I want to be able to sustain this mine. 
and we can grow organic mushrooms with the, the water because it's the perfect condition and temperature. Well, so they hit so much pink, bubble gum pink, and George was able to cut two gemstones about this size. One was faceted, pure bubble gum pink, Stuart lithia, and a cabochon that matched the size. It was the mother load. So here's a picture of earrings that are all cut by George, the, the gemstones, and they're all Stuart lithia material. And as magic and luck is with the artist, there was a gentleman that only bought tourmalines. And he had a huge collection. And when he met George, he just would buy almost anything George's hands had touched. And he called me after George died. But it was much later. George has been gone about 24 years. So it was probably four years ago. And um, he said, hey, Paul, I've got a couple of stones George cut. Would you be interested? I said, please send me everything you have. And I'll just send you the check. You fill it in. I do want them. And this was one. It's a, about an 18.16 carat bicolor. And it's from the Stuart Lithia mine. And another story is being told. I'm ending with Brazil, because I, I know all of you have not had enough on Brazil yet. And the reason I picked this slide to illustrate and pair with my uh, bracelet that I call the California Queen, um, but look at the growth. Think about the temperatures changing and the elemental shifts as those colors are brought to our eye. So I end with that there is the nature of science and art, and there's the art and science of nature. And, there's, and when we realize all of this, we realize that everything, everything is connected to everything else. Thank you.